Okay, let's get started. So first off, some announcements. Is this too loud, by the way, in the back or for everybody? Just fine. So next week, Tuesday, we'll have our first midterm exam that's here in this room. Mostly multiple choice, a few sort of short answer questions. It covers all the material that we've discussed so far. I'll ask questions about the book, things that we didn't discuss during the lectures. I'll ask about things that came up during the lectures that you can't find in the book. So that's the midterm. Any question about this upcoming midterm? Yes. Ah. That one, does this look familiar to you? Yeah, so you are responsible for bringing this Scantron um, and a pencil. And needless to say, it's a closed book, the exam. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, no, no study guide. Um, however, on Thursday, um, for those of you who are interested, you can ask any question about the material. We'll have a Q&A session. Um, you don't have to show up. If you feel like you know the material, feel free to not come. But for those of you who are confused about something, you can ask any question about the book or the contents of the lectures on Thursday. And if everybody knows the material, then it could be a very short class on Thursday. So any other, you have a question. With the free response, is there a word bank? Or like how are the free response questions? Just like... I'll test your, I haven't, I haven't made the questions yet. So <laughs> what should I do? Um, I'll, I'll keep it so that a short answer is appropriate. It could be the name of a concept, okay. potentially, yes. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll give you a little booklet. So we print out the, the questions, and you can write on there. Anything else? Yes? Yes. And I should have mentioned this earlier. Uh, is it this one? Uh, this is the link that you uh, follow when you access Triple E. And notice that here's a link playlist to lectures. Um, and this leads to a YouTube playlist. So there are three lectures there. And it will be, um, I guess last week's one isn't there yet, but it will be done soon, right? Um, and then today's will be, I'm, I'm sure, up uh, soon as well. So yes, you can, you can look at the materials, um, all the stuff we discussed during class online. Yeah? Anything else? Okay, so today we'll talk about um, a new uh, chapter from the book about classical conditioning. Uh, that's today's section, and operant conditioning next week, Thursday. Um, and so generally this is um, the study of learning. Now it's already hard to uh, come up with a definition of what, what we mean by learning. So one aspect of learning is that there's a long-lasting change. Um, so any sort of short-term aspects of cognition, um, that's really not about learning. It should be something long-lasting, something fairly, um, yeah, 
uh, on a long temporal scale. It should involve knowledge and behavior, uh, not just, just some state, change in some physical state like fatigue, um, but something in your mind should be altered. And it should be as a result of experience, right? You, you're learning about something. You're learning about the world. Now, there are different uh, traditions in psychology uh, to study learning. And here, the, the, the two biggest divides in psychology, um, the divide between behaviorism in the early 20th century and cognitivism, uh, essentially the approach we take uh, now, today, from the 1950s to present. So in behaviorism, the focus was on very simple learning mechanisms, mechanisms that can be applied to humans as well as animals, that could be applied to just a variety of uh, context conditions. Um, the focus here was on animal studies. Uh, the idea was that animals are more easily controlled. You can do easily, more easily do experiments, uh, fewer ethical issues to worry about, perhaps. Um, and most importantly, uh, animals don't have sort of a rich knowledge background um, that might potentially contaminate uh, the, the results. At least that was the uh, idea of behind behaviorism. And so behaviorists, uh, some of who we will talk about today, they introduced stimulus response theories. They really boil down all of learning to the learning of associations between Stimulus and response. Um, and they were kind of extreme in that way. Uh, they made a claim, a very bold claim, that all of learning, including very complex behaviors, uh, were due to just simple associations. Now, uh, a lot of the stuff that we'll talk about today is, is extremely useful. Um, it has real-world applications, uh, and it's based on behaviorism. It, we, from behaviorist research, we know how to deal with phobias and potentially um, uh, extinguish certain phobias. We know how to deal with uh, uh, problems of drug addiction, uh, how, how to perhaps prevent overdose deaths. Um, but clearly, behaviorism is, is too limited. Um, so in the 1950s, people started to complain, saying that learning is surely much more complex than just stimulus-response relationships. Uh, the learning of a language can't just be learning of association between words that you hear or words that you hear and some response in the environment. It has to be uh, involve representations. It has to involve more complex mental processes. One example of a, a, a mental model uh, or an information processing model was that uh, modal memory model that we discussed, um, I think, two weeks ago. That's an example of the kind of model that came up during uh, the cognitivism era. And also cognitivists, they, they focus much more on human learning as opposed to animal learning. So there's a number of forms of learning that we'll go into today. Um, the simplest form of learning just relates to a single stimulus. Um, and it's habituation. So it turns out um, that a response to a stimulus um, will decline if the stimulus is repeated uh, over and over again. We, have, we are learning uh, which things are interesting and which things are not interesting. Things that repeat themselves over and over in the environment are probably less interesting and probably less important to pay attention to. Things that are novel um, are things that will automatically draw our attention in terms of eye movements. Uh, it will capture uh, our attention. So the, the, the polar opposite of habituation is disambituation. Um, so whenever you present something new, that can lead to an increase in responsiveness. Now that is, um, let's see, oh here's the video. That is very useful as a way to um, study infant cognition. So pre-verbal infants, let's say we're talking about an infant that's, that's nine months old, it's very difficult to do research uh, with uh, humans at that age. You don't quite, you, you can't quite ask questions like what do you know, what, what don't you know? But you can do clever experiments that involve the principle of habituation. You can show a certain stimulus, and if you show a certain stimulus uh, over and over again, the infant will habituate. 
Now, how can you measure that? You can measure locking time. If the infant uh, thinks it's interesting, it will look more, will look more often, have more eye gazes towards the object. But will gradually habituate. Now, if you now introduce a new object, and the infant is still bored, and it will still not sort of uh, look or will look as much as it was looking before, then you know that the infant has not discriminated between object two, this new object, and object one. And therefore, you can draw conclusions that the infant is in it, unable to draw a distinction between those two objects. If, on the other hand, you have a new object and you see a dishabituation finding, so all of a sudden looking times increase, then you know that the infant is able to discriminate between these two objects. And that can be useful to draw conclusions about what things infants can process. So infants that are two months old, they might not be able to discriminate very well between certain faces. Let's say the face of the mother and the face of the father. Um, but a four month infant is probably able to do this and will find, might habituate to the mother's face, but might quickly dishabituate to the father's face. And then you know that there's a distinction, a mental distinction um, uh, in, the, in the infant. So here's a little example video of how this paradigm might work. And, and this, is, this is very tricky research. You have to um, carefully monitor uh, the infant's eyes, see where it's looking. Let's see, is the audio on? So it's becoming gradually more bored. So you get the idea. And now you present something novel, and all of a sudden you get the interest back of, of the infant. Now, a more interesting form of learning um, is about relationships between stimuli. And there, there are two uh, forms of uh, associative learning. One is classical conditioning, and the other is operant conditioning. So classical conditioning is about the learning of um, uh, reflexive responses to new stimuli. So classical conditioning uh, started based on the seminal research by Pavlov with his, with his dogs. So Pavlov um, did not in, intend to study human learning or animal learning. He was a physiologist. He studied um, the digestive tract of, tract of animals. But to his amazement, he discovered that the, the dogs were learning all kinds of things in anticipation of food. Uh, the sight of the animal tear cake, tear cake caretaker or uh, so certain sounds that would precede the presentation of food. Uh, so I want to show you a video that gives you a sense of the, the setup um, of how Pavlov uh, did his experiments. Pavlov's aim was to discover what caused saliva to flow. He rerouted the saliva ducts to the outside of his dog's cheek so that he could collect and measure the stick. Perhaps, he thought, the production of saliva might be the result of a fixed nervous reflex, like a major. Mm. Yes, you know it. So, the way can be separate After taking many measurements of spittle, he confirmed that the dogs drooled automatically when their tongues touched food. He called the response the salivation reflex. But his work started to run into trouble. As his dogs became familiar with the experimental routine, they started to fill their cheek tubes before Pavlov had a chance to stimulate their tongues. 
the dogs were learning to anticipate food. Pavlov tried a new technique. He erected screens so that the dogs couldn't see what was going on. Before passing meat through the hatch, he introduced a stimulus that was totally unrelated to feeding. A ticking machine. The dog drips saliva into its cheek tube only when the food appeared. But after a number of trials, the dog began to connect the ticking with the arrival of meat. Soon the sound alone made the dog drool. Eventually, the dog salivated as much to the ticking itself as it is originally to the presentation of food. Come there! It is to that. Hmm? Stay away. Hmm? He called this new response the conditioned reflex. Uh -oh. Whatever the stimulus, his dogs could soon be conditioned to produce saliva. All right, so this gives you a bit of a sense of how he did his experiments. So any questions about that setup? Okay, so here's, here's a summary of the finding and basically uh, a pictorial description of the classical conditioning paradigm. So before training, there's the unconditioned stimulus and an unconditioned response and there's a reflex where um, salivation is a reflexive response to food in the mouth. Right, so the notation used here is US unconditioned stimulus leads to an unconditioned response salivation. That's just already there, established, you know, um, perhaps evolutionary. No training is necessary. Now, if you pair before any training a tone or some other stimulus, um, or if you just present a tone, I should say, that's the conditioned stimulus, before training, there's no response. <clears throat> now, during training, <clears throat> you present this CS, the tone, with the unconditioned stimulus, the food in the mouth. And how you do this pairing is very important. Let's say that the CS precedes the US. So the tone is presented a little bit before the food in the mouth um, is, is presented. Uh, either at the same time or a little bit before. We'll go into the, the, the exact temporal relationship in a few slides. But that establishes an association between the tone and the food. Then after training, this is the classical conditioning result, you get the same reflexive response. Uh, the US still leads to the salivation response. That hasn't changed at all. But now the tone by itself, without any presentation of food, can also lead to the salivation response. So it's as if the, the animal has learned this association between um, the conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus, or alternatively between the conditioned stimulus and, and the response. Now, as we'll see, this response, the learned response, can be very similar to the unconditioned response, but it can also be very different. But this, in a nutshell, is classical conditioning. Now, one, um, there's, there's a whole lot of details that are very interesting to study. One is about the temporal, the, the time course of learning. Now, learning takes time. It takes some pairings of the CS and, and US for learning to evoke uh, a conditioned response. So in this sort of hypothetical curve, so you have time going uh, horizontally. And if you do this pairing, over time, you, the, the animal, the dog, let's say, learns that the food will arrive um, uh, when a tone is presented. Now, what happens when the CS is presented, but food no longer arrives? 
So that's called the extinction phase in classical conditioning. So the uh, result is that if the CS presented without the uh, unconditioned stimulus, you see extinction. Gradually, the animal learns that um, that association is no longer true. But again, that takes some time. Now, here's the curious result. If you now take, take a break from the experiment, come back, and you present that tone again that seemed to be extinguished uh, after you know, this, this extinction phase, what you see is spontaneous recovery. It's as if the dog um, believes that the food might be coming after all when you uh, have the tone presented or the metronome. And that's a somewhat curious finding. Um, then if you then have this extinction phase where you just present a CS alone, just tones and, and nothing else, you again extinguish this, um, this whatever recovery was, was presented here during this phase. And you need to have multiple extinction phases for the response to really um, uh, disappear. But there's still a question. So if um, spontaneous recovery does not um, occur anymore, has the association been completely erased, or is there still some residual knowledge somewhere in the organism that there is the potential of, um, of a relationship between the tone and, and, and the food? And it turns out that um, even if you see complete extinction, the animal still somewhere uh, has some residual knowledge of this association between uh, the stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus because it takes you less trials to re, uh, sort of recondition uh, the, the animal. Fewer trials are needed to reestablish the, the salivation response. So what's important here is that the extinction um, happens in a specific context. Right? So you present a CS in a specific context, and if, if there's no um, food, the dog might learn, I'm getting no food in this particular condition, in this, you know, uh, when, at this time of day, with this person present. And so it's learning, okay, it's not happening now. During spontaneous recovery, the dog might believe, okay, maybe it will happen now in this different context, different point in time, different spatial context. So to truly extinguish a response, you need to train uh, in very different uh, contexts. And that has consequences for how you deal with um, learned fears. Uh, people that have a fear of heights or fear of spiders or snakes. If you try to extinguish this response by presenting the, the fearful stimulus, let's say it's the spider or the snake, but you make sure that the, the, that the people feel safe, right? There's, there's no uh, unconditioned stimulus present. Um, then you can extinguish this fear response, but only in that particular context. Um, you're learning, like, I, I'm safe now, at this point in time, with this particular spider or snake. But in a different context, you're, you, might be, you might see spontaneous recovery, um, where people are again fearful. Uh, it's because you need to extinguish um, this, these responses under many different circumstances. Does that make sense? Yes? Yeah, that ties back to memory and how you can implement false memories. Is, that, is there a correlation between that where you can have someone believe that something should happen based on a certain event and then over time they forget it? However, if you give them that same response, they would... What is the response in this case? Yeah, I don't quite see the connection yet. Okay. Um, okay, so I guess I guess the final point is like how we're talking about how the spontaneous recovery occurs. Yes. Of the conditioned response. Yes. When we tie it back to memory, is there a plausible connection there where they're actually remembering the responses there, or? So uh, I, I guess the point is so clearly this is a form of memory. Right? And, and this is more a form of implicit memory than explicit memory. That's one distinction. Um, uh, and the, what the animal is learning is, is sometimes it's very specific about this stimulus right now. 
and this other stimulus right now in this context, sometimes the animal or human can generalize beyond that. Um, yes. Okay. So there's a lot of research with animals, and there are obvious reasons why we have to be careful in working with humans. Um, so a lot of classical conditioning involves reflexes, reflexes fear responses, um, and you have to be very careful uh, with training people to be fearful or even you know, preventing them to, to be fearful of some, some things, uh, because you can do long-lasting uh, damage. So Watson is an, an infamous researcher. He's one of those behaviorists that uh, had fewer sort of ethical uh, constraints, so to speak. So he did some experiments with young infants where he exposed them to some innocent stimuli and then uh, trained them, uh, or he, he exposed them to some fearful stimuli where the infant learned the, associ the association between the innocent stimulus and the, uh, the fearful stimulus. So let's watch. John Watson and Rosalie Rain set up to teach a baby boy for a little hour to feel white rats using the principle of classical condition. This is a film of their work. The film shows several phases of their study. First, as you see here, the investigators demonstrated that prior to conditioning, little Albert had no fears of any animals, including, of course, white rats. So this is before training, where he likes the rat. All right, well, you get the idea. So poor little Albert. Um, <laughs> aye, aye, aye. Um, this is why nowadays, if you do any experiment with people, you need to get approval from the IRB, uh, which is a good thing before you do these crazy experiments. Um, now, one good outcome, I guess, a um, little salient detail here. Uh, Watson, he had an affair with his grad student, uh, shown in on the right which is a big no-no in, in, in any university. So he was relieved from his duties. Um, unfortunately, uh, little Albert, um, he was in a hospital situation. 
Um, and he moved on to a different hospital and nobody ever uh, sort of dealt with his fear response. So he uh, might have had this uh, fearful response, uh, uh, unfortunately, for the rest of his life. Uh, yeah. So you have to be very careful. So any, any question about that? And this, by the way, was just, uh, I believe it was only 10 Ten present ten loud hammer noises. Is it six? Is it six? Okay, I read. Okay, six. Six uh, pairings with uh, with the white rat. That was sufficient to develop this sort of deep learned response that generalized to you know a variety of other fluffy things, including a Santa beard. Um, okay, so there's a number of these US UR pairings you could study. Uh, Pavlo studied the food salivation response. You can study uh, um, electric shocks, uh, pain reaction, uh, food of, learn food aversions. Um, those are particularly strong. Or very simple ones like uh, puffs of air and how they can evoke an eye blink response. Now, all of this is uh, implicit learning. Uh, this is using routes that are very different from the explicit le uh, learning route. Uh, explicit memory route that we discussed uh, the last lecture. And these are different sort of brain areas involved. Uh, it's, it's very involuntary. When you, you can train yourself on, on these, um, with these uh, stimulus response relationships, and it's hard to control it. So here's one rare video that I found where a person is learning an eye blink response um, in response to, uh, I think, um, some, some hammer on, on a desk. And this is outside um, sort of conscious control. So let's, let's, see, let's see this video. OK, as you can see, Howard has got a, a saw pointing at his eye. And uh, the alarm set of saws that are taped together comes to a blue bump on my desk over here. And if I squeeze the ball, Howard has to blink. And I guess that's the door of the screen here. Uh, because the air is stopping in his eye. And we've got to turn it in such a way that um, uh, he can't uh, see the, the blue ball. Now, from classical conditioning, we could uh, expect that since what we have here is a, is a reflex, that whenever the air puffs, that, uh, that he should blink, right? Who really has no choice over that? But let's suppose, and this may take more coordination than I have. <laughs> Remember Jerry Ford, President Ford, trying to walk and chew gum at the same time? And I'm going to try and use a, a pencil tap here and pair that with uh, the, uh, the pop of air enough times. And then uh, let's eventually see what, uh, what happens. All right, you get the idea. Um, uh, so this train, by the way, this, this is probably happening in the cerebellum. Uh, there's some circuitry that 
has this very fast training um, where this learning takes place, and this works even for people, right? So this guy might reflexively blink whenever he hears a pencil tap. Um, that might go on for a long time. Okay, so there's a number of concepts um, and phenomena related to classical conditioning. So let's go through these. So there's second order conditioning, generalization, discrimination, temporal ordering, contingency, and blocking. Okay, so first, second order conditioning. So you can study not just single associations, but also chains of associations. And you can train people to learn these chains. So that's what second order conditioning is about. So if you first present um, a, a training phase where the food is paired with the sound, so the US is paired with one conditioned stimulus, that might establish uh, this relationship, this, this, this association. Now if you, in the second phase, have another stimulus, let's say CS2, let's say it's light, and that precedes the first conditioned stimulus, the sound, and very important, it's followed by no food, so there's no US here, then now this person can learn that the light is indicative of the sound coming. Then in the third phase, the testing phase, if you now present light by itself, that can actually elicit the conditioned response. Although that response is not quite as strong as if you presented the first uh, conditioned stimulus. So a chain is learned between different stimuli. And behaviors thought that complex behaviors can be trained in this way. Um, so it seems very difficult to go from reflexive behaviors to very complex things like language. Um, but this is how they envisioned uh, that this would work. Uh, that you set up this very complex chain or web of, of stimuli and learning associations between them. The other concept is generalization. So we've seen with little Albert. Little Albert was trained to be afraid of white rats but he also became afraid of other fur furry things, including Santa beards. So that's an example of generalization. Now in experiments, you can establish a generalization gradient. You can see how the response sort of levels off if you move further and further away from the preferred stimulus. In this experiment, a, a 1200 hertz tone was um, paired with the unconditioned stimulus. I think it was an electric shock. And not surprisingly, if you present the 1200, 1200 hertz tone, the exact same tone at test, you get a, a pretty good um, conditioned response. But if you present somewhat higher pitch tones or lower pitch tones, you get a somewhat lower response. And how this this curve sort of levels off as a function of the stimulus and the distance from the original stimulus. That's called a generalization gradient. So that indicates sort of how far a person or an animal is willing to generalize and, and believe uh, that the conditioned response is related to this new stimulus. Does that make sense? Okay, so here's a tricky thing that when it comes to temporal ordering. It's very important that the CS and the US are presented in the correct temporal sequence. If you present, let's say, the tone, let's say that that's the CS, that's shown in green here. If you present the tone after the unconditioned stimulus, let's say it's a shock, no learning takes place. So in this graph, the stimulus interval is shown, so it's the delay between the CS and U US. If you have negative numbers, that means that the CS is arriving after the US. And the vertical axis shows how much of a response there is. So here there's very little response, or actually less of a response when you have backwards pairing. So the animal's not learning anything if the conditioned stimulus arrives after the unconditioned stimulus. Does 
If you do simultaneous pairing, if you have the tone and the shock at the same time, then also very little learning takes place. You saw in the video with the eye blink, um, um, the, the pencil tap preceded the uh, delivery of the uh, puff of air. So it was not simultaneous. And when you have this forward pairing, so we hear the, 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 the pencil tap preceded the puff of air, or the tone precedes the shock, then you get the strongest um, uh, conditioned response. And it varies from stimulus to stimulus, but it's about a half a second leads to the optimal delay. If it's shorter than that, the uh, less, uh, the association is not very strong. If it's very long, the association is also not very strong. So temporal ordering is one key ingredient to successful associative learning. Now here's the trickiest concept. That's probably the most confusing uh, to you. The concept of contingency. The primary factor in establishing an association is a probabilistic relationship between the US and the CS. The CS should be informative about the arrival of the US. And it should be informative in a sort of probabilistic fashion. Now, what does that mean? So let's give an example. Suppose there are 200 trials. 60 trials, you present a CS and the US follows, or you present a CS and 40, 40 trials, no US follows. So it's more likely that the US follows after this condition stimulus than not. Now that by itself is not sufficient to trigger learning. It's, it's also important what happens when you don't present the CS. So in this particular example, there are also 60 trials where the US follows after no CS was present. And here there's no contingency. The arrival of the CS does not give you information about whether the US follows or not. And therefore no conditioning occurs. In the bottom example, the numbers look very similar, but here there is a contingency between the CS and US. So now it is slightly more likely when the CS arrives that the US arrives. But it's, it's probabilistic, right? It's, it's six out of 10 times, 60% uh, chance when the CS is present, 40% chance when the CS is not present. Here conditioning does uh, take place. So conditioning does occur. So you have to look at the full pattern of the data. Um, it's not just the number of times that the US is paired with the CS, that's not sufficient. You have to look at the contingency pattern, the whole table. Does that make sense? Um, is there any question about this? So here's another a tricky example. Suppose you have a stimulus that's always on. So in Pavlov's experiments, there, there's a light maybe that's always on. There's a door that's always there. There's a wall that's always there. That surely can't uh, be learned that that's relevant. Um, so if, if the food arrives and the wall is always there, the food arrives and the, the door is always there, that's, that doesn't seem very informative. So if you look at this example in this contingency table, if you have no CS presence, so you have zeros in the bottom row, and you have, let's say the CS, uh, when the CS is present and the CS is always present, 50% of the time the US is, is, occurs and 50% it, it does not, there's no learning here that takes place. Again, there's no contingency. The key here is what happens with the numbers off the diagonal. If this number and that number is high, then you have a contingency. Um, so when it's more likely that the US arrives when the CS arrives and less likely when the CS is not there, that's the key. It's hard to explain this in words, but um, does that conceptually make sense? Okay. Here's another tricky thing. Uh, this looks a little bit like second order conditioning, but this leads to very different effects. So this is called blocking. And this shows 
that what matters here is the new information that's provided by a stimulus. Suppose in this paradigm you have one stimulus that's paired with the US. Let's say it's a tone paired with a shock. In the second training phase, you introduce a new stimulus, CS2. Let's say it's light. So you now have, again, the tone with the shock, but light is introduced. And let's say that light is, shown, is presented at the exact same time as the tone. Now, you might think intuitively that the person or animal might learn this association between tone and shock and between light and shock because there appears to be this contingency. But the result is that if you now present the light by itself, even though it was paired with the shock, there's no learning that took place for this second stimulus. And that's a curious finding. Why is that? Because of blocking. During the second phase, this light provided no new information about this arrival of the shock. The shock was already perfectly predictable by the arrival of the tone. So contingency also is not quite sufficient for learning. It's contingency plus it should be something new that's presented by the stimulus. Light here doesn't present any new information, so therefore there's no association learned between light and shock. So the, the, the stimulus should provide new and independent information. That's the key finding in, in this blocking paradigm. Now, the reason why this is tricky, this looks, looks very much like second order conditioning, right? In second order conditioning, you learn first one association. In the training phase, you introduce this new stimulus. You have a CS1 and a CS2. And voila, in second order conditioning, you do have this generalization from the second stimulus to the conditioned response. Now, what's different? The difference here is that in this blocking paradigm, you still present the US during this second training phase. The other major difference is that in blocking, you present CS1 and CS2 at the exact same time. The, the tone and the light is presented at the exact same time, and therefore, the light does not provide any independent new information about the US. In second order conditioning, you present the light, the new stimulus, before the tone, and no US. So there, the light can be predictive of the tone. And there, you do get uh, generalization. Does that make sense? OK. Now, often these conditioned responses, they can be very similar to the uh, unconditioned response. So your fear response to some new stimulus might be very similar to the free response of the original sort of evolutionary response. But sometimes your conditioned response might be very, very different from the unconditioned response. It might be more like a preparatory response that's adaptive to the organism. For example, um, if you shock a rat, the heart rate uh, will go up and the animal will try to escape, will jump up. But the conditioned response, let's say there's a tone that the animal has learned to pair with the, uh, with the shock, the tone might actually lower the heart rate and might freeze the, the rat in place, which could be an adaptive response. Um, your response to caffeine, your learned response to caffeine, that might be um, uh, different from the actual effects of caffeine. Athletes that are anticipating uh, intense physical activity, they might get to get the pregame jitters. And this might be because the body is releasing uh, blood sugars in response or in anticipation of intense physical activity and, and preparing for this physical activity. Now, in other cases, the um, <coughs> The, the preparation could be of the polar opposite of the unconditioned response. It might actually be compensatory response. For example, with, with drug addiction, uh, 
Your response to the drug might elevate your mood. Your conditioned response, all the things you learn in association with the drugs, the needles, the place where you take drugs, let's say, if we talk about heroin users, that might actually lower or depress your mood. And the body might be learning to prepare itself for the oncoming uh, drug and try to sort of compensate for this, for the effect of the drug. There's an amazing experiment with rats in ice boxes, where rats are put in these freezing ice boxes, and so they learn that uh, ice boxes are cold, and they have this uh, reflex where the body of the rat is doing all it can to elevate its temperature. Now, if you put the rat in an ice box, uh, in, in this ice box, but now you don't turn the ice box on. What you find is this compensatory response where the rat actually increases its body temperature. That's because the rat has learned to fight the, the cold in the ice box, and now it just sees the ice box again and tries to compensate for the oncoming uh, cold. And I think perhaps the most amazing um, uh, finding is that the um, compensatory responses might explain why some animals or people die in certain conditions but not others uh, under drug uh, when an overdose of drugs is delivered. So in this experiment, uh, rats were given heroin and they gradually de developed a tolerance for the heroin. Right, so you learn this compensatory response, you, your body is fighting the, the effects of the drug, and over time you're becoming better at, at this compensatory response. So you can deal with higher and higher amounts of the drug. So these rats that learned this tolerance, they were now given an overdose, twice the amount of the drug as they were given before. And when these rats were in the same setting, let's say it's the same sort of cage that they were in, the, the same uh, other animals that they were paired with, about 65% of them died uh, because of the overdose. But fewer of these rats died when they were in the same physical context than when they were in this different context. So when they were put in a different cage, a different physical setting, different time, more of these rats died, even though they got the same amount of drug. And the explanation is that this compensatory response didn't kick in. They didn't have this um, learned response, this compensatory response, because the setting was sufficiently different. And this might explain why heroin addicts can sometimes die if they are placed in a novel surrounding. Their usual compensatory response, which allows them to survive dealing with these high amounts of, of toxic drugs, doesn't kick in because they're in a new environment. The body hasn't learned that sort of association yet. And so it can't deal with, this, this, um, with the effects of the drug and, and therefore people can die. So that's one explanation for these seemingly puzzling uh, deaths of heroin addicts in these new environments. Okay, so that's it for today. Uh, we'll see each other on a Q&A session on, on Thursday.